I can't tell you exactly when I realized how much grief and loss had shaped my life and uh, how much had shaped the life of the people that I love around me. But I can tell you um, how it profoundly shaped a story I wrote last year and really drove me to chase that story. And that story is about Marie Tillman and her journey through grief and loss, 10 years after losing her Pat Tillman. And we have an Arizona audience on a 125, so I think most of us are very familiar with Pat Tillman. We love him in our own way. Um, so Pat Tillman, the Sun Devil, Pat Tillman, the Cardinal, and Pat Tillman, the man who gave up $3.6 million to join the military after 9-11. And that was Marie's Pat. That was Marie's Pat, who she found out she lost as a victim of friendly fire. So I'm going to tell you about sitting at her parents' dinner table, across from her having coffee and having her talk me through what it had been like to go from losing him to starting life over. And I'm going to tell you about how she made it through the light on the other side of the tunnel. And I'm going to tell you about how, as reporters, we are taught to be objective. But how sometimes we're faced with stories where we have to let our guard down. But before I do that, I have to tell you about my grandma. <laughs> I love my grandma and grandpa. <laughs> grandma, um, every weekend in Northern California, we would go visit my grandma and my grandpa at their little farm. Um, little, little, tiny farm. I don't even know if it qualifies as a farm, but they had pigs and cows and chickens, so I'm calling it a farm. <laughs> I'm sticking with that. Um, and we'd go on a Friday, and we'd leave on a Sunday, and we'd be in the driveway and Grandma would stop us because every time she had to do the sign of the cross in Spanish. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even then, my Spanish was not as good as Grandma wanted my Spanish to be. <laughs> and I certainly did not go to Catholic Church as much as Grandma wanted me to go to Catholic Church. But even today, I know Grandma's sign of the cross in Spanish. El Espíritu Santo. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I think I saw him. Quiet. Um, I wasn't there. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So Grandma would do me, my mom, my dad, and that was because she was trying to keep us safe, or really she was asking to keep us safe because about ten minutes from Grandma's house gotten a call that about 10 minutes from her house, her oldest son, Frank, Francisco, had been in a car accident shortly before I was born. And the driver made it, and Frank did not. And Grandma also knew my mom's mom, because this is a small town, and in small towns, you know everyone. So she knew that when my mom was 10, my mom's mom was in a car accident, and my mom and her infant brother died in that car accident too, about 20 minutes from where Grandma's farmhouse was. So Grandma did the sign of the cross to keep us safe. And I didn't really understand at the time why Grandma did the sign of the cross. I knew that that was part of what she did, those things. I knew that she didn't drive because she was scared. And I knew that my mom didn't drive because she was scared too. So these are things I just knew, but I didn't understand until I was nine. When I was nine years old, I had a cousin named Sherry Ann, and she was two years old. And I adored Sherry Ann. I had been annoying my parents, bugging my parents, pleading with my parents for a brother or sister. And I was not getting one. I was very upset. Mom had 11 brothers and sisters. Dad had seven. We were Mexican. Come on. Can I get a brother or a sister? <laughs> It didn't happen. I'm very demanding, but I didn't get one. I got Sherry Ann, and Sherry Ann was my sister. And I was over there at Aunt Josephine's all the time, and I just kind of owned her. One day, Sherry Ann got sick. Um, she had a little fever, and they took her to the hospital, 
and they said, take her home, keep an eye on her, watch her fever, let us know if it goes up. The cherry ants fever went up really high, right away, took her back, and she was very sick, so sick that they almost immediately transferred her to the good hospitals in the big city. And I was at grandma's house. My mom and dad went to go visit Sherry Ann a few weeks after. Sherry Ann had been in the hospital, they went to go see my Aunt Jo. And <clears throat> my dad came home and he walked in the door. I was at grandma's house and I was excited to see him to hear about Sherry Ann. And he says, Miha, uh, Miha Sherry Ann is gone. And I'm nine, so I'm like, Sherry Ann's gone from the hospital. We're cool, let's get in the car, let's go see her, let's go play, let's go seeing you are my sunshine. Um, and my poor dad had to explain that Sherry Ann had gone to heaven. Sherry Ann had died in the hospital. So in that instant, I understood the signs of the cross, and the not driving, because people can have a fever, and people can get in a car, and not come home. So I think, I didn't realize at the time that for grief in our family, we built all these walls to protect ourselves. But I went through the next 15 years, and in our family, it wasn't if someone was going to die, it was when. And 15 years later, we got a call from Aunt Irma. And Aunt Irma had been in the car with me because after Aunt Sherry, Aunt after Sherry Ann passed away. I listened, I eavesdropped. My nickname was Orejas, which is ears in Spanish, yes, you know. <laughs> I was early in training for reporting. Um, <laughs> I wanted to hear someone say why God had let this happen. And Aunt Irma was the one that was stuck in the back seat with me when we went to the funeral, and I cornered her and I asked her, why did this happen? Why did God let this happen? And Aunt Irma said, oh, mija, Sherry Ann was so wonderful, and God needed her. He needed her for his angel. And I remember looking at her and thinking, what a load of courage. <laughs> <laughs> what a load of courage. I need Sherry Ann. I need her here. She's my sister. So, 15 years later, we get a call, Aunt Irma's daughter, about 10 minutes from her house, had bought her a new car so she could visit often from college. She got in a car accident with a semi-truck head-on and was killed. 19, Christina. My mom and I lived in Arizona now, so we immediately got on a plane, booked the first thing we could get, went to Irma's. And all the sisters were there, and this time all the sisters' daughters were there, and we all gathered around Aunt Irma to try and help her. But this time, this death was different for me because I had been expecting it. So I had closed myself off to feeling the loss other than telling people that I loved them. So now I'm gonna take you back to Marie Tillman and what it was like to interview Marie Tillman about two years ago for the first time. And I remember seeing her, and I think actually the first time was three years ago, seeing her, she came to, she allowed ASU to name the Tillman Center after her husband, and she was very careful to not give that name to anyone. She even asked, but she still loved this man and she protected him. So I went and saw the opening, saw her remarks, wrote a story, and just thought, what an amazing person. So the next year, I wanted to talk to her, and I don't think I really realized truly why. I mean, I was the Tempe reporter, this was a story I could do, so I was going to do the story. And I called the Tillman Foundation, and I got an interview with Marie Tillman over the phone from her home in Chicago. And she told me during the conversation about Pat's Run and the 30,000 people, and all the things, the questions that I was supposed to ask as a reporter. And along that conversation, she says, and I don't want to get it wrong because this is really important to me. She says, it's a lifelong journey. She's talking about grief. But I had gotten to a point where I felt really good in my life. And people would come up to me and talk to me about their loss. 
I had been looking for something when I was in a really bad place, wondering is there an end, a light at the end of the tunnel, and how do I get there? There is no manual, but it does help to hear other people's stories. And all I could think was a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'd always thought of Aunt Jo as the person who didn't make it, the person who was heart sick, the person who changed and was never the same. And that we were okay, my mom and I, because we didn't drive, and we didn't feel people when they died. We were okay. But I, we weren't. And Marie Tillman was someone that had gone through that grief. And she talked about the light at the end of the tunnel and the ability for her to share that story with other people. And it was so important for me to share her story and to explain it in the same exact way that she had explained it. So I wrote the story, finished the story, story published, and I thought I had just totally missed the mark. It was not at all what she had said. I hadn't helped anybody. I hadn't done her justice. And as reporters, we do a story and we often move on. We don't get a lot of second chances at stories. The next year was 10 years. 10 years since Pat Tillman had died, 10 years of the run. And I called the Pat Tillman Foundation. And I asked again, could I get an interview with Marie Tillman? And they said, oh, she's really, really busy. Let us call you back. And I did not expect to be able to get that interview, but I had to try. I had to try for my second chance to get it right. So I got a call back, and they said, if you can get to San Jose within a matter of like five days, <laughs> and she can meet you at her parents' house in San Jose, and she will sit down and do that interview. So somehow I managed to be able to get to San Jose, I managed to be able to get to her house, and I remember sitting there at her dinner table at her parents' home overlooking the high school where she and Pat Tillman fell in love. And she sat there and she talked and I was struck by her two-year-old running around, her two-year-old named Matt Patrick, her husband holding their newborn, her parents fixing breakfast and thinking this house is full of so much life and so much life that in many ways we had closed off in our own family because we were always expecting death. So at one point while she's talking, she says she struggles because she's going back and I'm asking her questions. I'm asking her to go back. And I can see her struggling and I'm a reporter and I'm supposed to remain objective. And I decided to tell her about Sherry Ann. And my Aunt Jo never made it, and about how hearing her story helped, helped me. And she looked at me and she said, that's, that's why I'm doing this. So she finished her story, I thanked her, they were gonna go to San Francisco. I got in the car, I went home, Got on the plane, thought about it, wrote my story, was very scared, I wanted to get it right. But this time it was a little different. Because this time, I realized that I wasn't going to get a call telling me you had done the story that you know, helped me. That's not how this works. That's not how journalism works. We do the best we can. We feel the best we can to tell your stories. And in this instance, I had opened myself, even though we're taught to remain objective, our editors remind us to remain objective, but sometimes the best stories we can tell is when we let ourselves feel the stories. So, thank you.